Hi, everyone, and welcome to the City of Santa Clarita Arts Symposium. This year's event is virtual, of course. It's part of the New Heights Artist Development Series, where we do free workshops for artists to really help them move their careers forward. Tonight's panel is Be Seen, Small Screen, Big Dreams. So I'm really excited to have three people that have done really interesting work in the web series space talk about their projects and talk about what you can do if you're creating a web series, already have a web series. You know, it's a great time, I think, for small format, for this format right now. People are consuming probably more of this content than they were before. So just give you some time to like learn about this concept and this content and see how it can help you move your career forward and your filmmaking and creative work forward. So I'm gonna let Ray start and tell us about her animated series, which I was just watching today, it's very funny. So <laughs> Ray, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, well, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so me and my friend Julissa, we co-created an animated web series called Julissa Who. Um, we started it last year. It's been on, like a little bit over a year that it's been out now, actually. Um, we're currently in the process of developing it into a half hour comedy, uh, animated comedy that we can start pitching places. And so really excited about that. And yeah, basically we started the web series because we actually wanted to do a live action web series. Julissa had an idea, but it was really hard for her to wrangle people together, especially we have no money to pay anyone. <laughs> so she thought like, oh, well, let's do an anim let's just do animation because then I can only have to control one thing, which is the animator, and that was easier for her. So she started the project alone. She had did maybe one or two episodes and then she asked me to help her. And so I came in, rewrote some episodes, wrote new episodes and took it from there. Oh, oh I forgot to <laughs> unmute after my dog incident. <laughs> and animation is such a fun format and I think a good one for people to consider right now, perhaps when getting together is a little bit harder. So you can still do a lot with animation. You can tell a story. The episodes are shorter, of course, because animation takes a long time. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's kind of a talent in itself to be really funny in one minute and to tell a story in one minute. So I really appreciate the way you did that. And I would encourage people to check out the show. And I'll let you all plug at the end, of course. So yeah, I really love hearing that this was about you guys wanting to control and just like make something and not have to wait for anyone else. And that's like, I think a through line that I'm hearing a lot with indie creators, which I absolutely always love as an indie creator myself. So now Kibi, you did a talk show and you know, not so small. So this is right, a little bit yeah. <laughs> I think I think a slightly different perspective, but it'll be right. A, but that's yeah. important too. You know, you, exactly. you got yourself involved with Red Table Talk. It's a really high profile show. Jada Pinkett Smith. You know, so big names, but I think there's also lessons that indie creators can take from your experience as well. So I'm really interested to hear how you got involved and what you learned in working in this format of the web series. Absolutely, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Hi everybody, my name is Kibi Anderson. Um, and as Jen noted, I most recently have been connected with the um, Facebook Watch show, Red Table Talk, which is starring, you know, Jada Pinkett Smith, um, her mom and her daughter, three generations of black women talking about all kinds of, <laughs> I think, topics that in certain cases have in many ways been taboo. So um, one of the reasons why I think the show has been so popular and was so well received was because of, I think, kind of the courage that, you know, Jada and her family had to just kind of go there, you know, and really, really create a safe space for people to be vulnerable. Um, it's interesting. I actually came to the show after the season had started. So I am not a part of the original creation of this. I was brought on to basically run um, the digital business connected to sort of expanding the brand beyond just the show itself. So our vision with that was focused on extending into different platforms ranging from podcasts to, you know, sort of publishing to, um, you know, feature length films down the road if they were interesting, you know, sort of spinoffs. Um, you know, uh, just to kind of think about all the places that you might actually, you know, experience the brand beyond just the show. Um, but I definitely can comment on sort of the, ge the uh, genesis of the show, you know, because of obviously my kind of connection more, more, most intimately. Um, and I think it's an interesting one because as you said, high profile talent, you know, money not necessarily an, uh, an issue per se in terms of budget. You know, they pitched the show not only to networks, 
but to streaming platforms, Facebooks, the YouTubes, that kind of thing. And there was a very conscious decision by Jada to want to do it um, in a digital platform versus say a more traditional TV network um, because of a couple of things. One, she really, really wanted to have a lot more control. And I think that's just the nature of working with, you know, digital platforms. Um, they're known for giving, you know, creators a lot more control. And the other thing, and this is why I think Facebook kind of won out versus some of the other platforms is the fact that community was really important to her. She really wanted to be able to, to access and have kind of one-on-one -on -one direct opportunities to hear from the, you know, the viewers, to hear from, um, you know, people all over the world, you know, and the fact that Facebook is a global platform really played a role in that. So I know we're going to talk a little bit more about this later on, but when you think about audience development and building community, um, you know, having the flexibility, I think, of a digital platform, you know, we could immediately respond to topical things quickly, you know, because we could adjust. So if there was a show, i.e. when the Jordan Woods thing happened with the whole Kardashian stuff, um, you know, that was one of our, our top rated shows, that wasn't originally scheduled. You know, that was something that we decided to do kind of last minute because people were talking about it and we felt that it was something we should, well, Jada felt that it was something she wanted to do. So again, that ability to be nimble and flexible also comes with leveraging a web-based platform. Um, more so than not, but looking forward to chatting more about that whole process. Thank you. And I think creative control is a really important thing. As indie artists, we expect, I think, if you're going up towards a network or something, for them to want to take creative control. But to hear that even someone like Jada Pinkett Smith, with all of that heavy, still runs up against that, you know, <laughs> it's like the, 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 that's a real issue, and that the web now offers us so many opportunities to be in control. And I like that you talked about diversifying because I think indies don't always think about that but I know an indie musician who does that really well he takes things that stayed on the cutting floor and then he sells them to yoga studios and like he like finds all sorts of ways and art galleries to take you know one session and turn it into multiple revenue streams which is I think something as indies it's always good to think about yeah. so I like that you mentioned that as well so Lisa now to you and your scripted comedy series yeah, hi, I'm Lisa Ebersall. I'm the creator, director, star, producer of 37 Problems, which is a comedy about a 37-year-old single woman who finds out she has one egg left and fertility crisis ensues. Um, yeah, and it's an interesting, I was a playwright in New York for many years, uh, off off Broadway and had like a tech job to pay the bills. And then I came to LA and went to grad school thinking, okay, now somebody's gonna like pluck me out of obscurity and I'm not gonna have to do these two different things anymore. Um, and what I found was that at the end of three years of writing scripts, I really missed making stuff. So 30, and also the stories I wanted to tell were I don't know, not supposedly what everyone was interested in. Um, so I did like a 180 and I wrote a story about exactly what was going on in my life, which was that I was 37, I was single, I was in grad school, friends were freezing their eggs, I didn't even know if I wanted to have a baby and was kind of freaking out about all of it. And that's what I wrote about. And ultimately, none of the other scripts I wrote sold or got any attention and this one, I created the web series myself, but it then did sell to several distributors and has gotten me tons of pitch meetings since then, so. That's great. And I think um, I wanna move into audience and I think one of the through lines though I'm taking from all of you is the personal, right? I think for each of you, for the people heavily involved in this project, the projects are very personal. And so I think that that probably, I'm guessing, is related to how you reach audience and how you resonate with an audience is by telling something that you actually is something about your own truth, because I think that that's going to be more compelling than sort of putting it on. And what I see a lot of indie creators do is they say, what's hot right now? Let me emulate that. But then you're going to miss that authenticity. So maybe if you guys could speak to that, like the importance of authenticity in your storytelling, and especially I think in the web format and also, or the digital format, and also how that helps you guide your audience outreach and your, you know, if you don't have an audience, then what is the point in some ways, right? You wanna reach people with your work. So, you know, how does that personal experience inform the work you create or, you know, the work that you're involved with and influence the audience outreach? Do you want me to go? <laughs> oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Lisa. I'll come out. 
Okay, cool. Um, no, I was just going to say it's, it's interesting because I feel like the, the message that a lot of writers and creators get is like, ask what the industry wants and give that to them. My experience was totally the opposite, that by like focusing on this really narrow personal niche, I managed to reach not everybody, but the people who related to that. Whereas when I was trying to like appeal to the world, it, it all kind of turned out to be fluff just from my personal experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you, Lisa. I think that especially in today's day, just because the ability for everyone whether you be celebrity or, you know, Joe Schmo kind of living in, you know, your local community to have the opportunity to be as authentic as they want to be <laughs> because of social media, I think just requires everybody to kind of show, show up in the same way. Otherwise, it's just so easy to see people who are not being honest. It's just so easy to sort of see through it. Um, and the thing I was going to say in terms of, you know, authenticity, I mean, listen, I think in many ways, especially if you don't have a huge budget for marketing, you are fighting against a ton of other noise, of other projects, other content out there that, um, you know, makes it hard for you to sort of gain traction. So it's a lot, I think, more smart and even easier, you know, at least I'm sure I can probably speak to this and Ray too, to, to find a niche that you are passionate about. You know, this stuff is not easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this stuff takes hard work, it's money, it's, you know, blood, sweat and tears, you're begging, you're borrowing, you're making things. I mean, because I've made web series as a producer, I've been a producer for 20 years, you know, and I've made other web series that, where I didn't have the kind of money, you know, that I have with Red Stable Talk, so I can talk from both sides. So the last thing you want to do is do something you don't really believe in, you know what I mean? And I think when you look at people like, you know, Issa Rae and, you know, other creators out there right now who have been able to make the switch, it's because they found a niche that probably wasn't being served and or doing it in a very interesting and creative way. And they, they just doubled down on that. And I think that's what actually wins. And in Hollywood specifically, I mean, I've been in this business for a long time. It's usually 90% of the time, it's people like Lisa, people like Ray, people like me who are out there doing and talking to that niche that no one's even thinking about <laughs> that end up making it because that's what feels good and people can connect with it and then you're able to bring it mainstream but the reality is this idea of like do what everybody's doing it never works it doesn't <laughs> well yeah especially there's so much noise right now right there's so much content on the web you know and so really to cut through i think is harder than ever before but if you're authentic if you find your niche it's going to give you half a chance right <laughs> so um so what has been one surprising thing that maybe worked for you with your audience? Was it film festivals? Was it some influencer shout it out? Was it a Twitter thing? Was it, I know Ray, you guys did a great parody that I really liked. <laughs> we did a red table talk parody actually. It's really well, it's really great. It's very good. It's that red table talk is legit. Like I love that show. So it was done in, Loving taste, but still, there. you know, it's the highest form of flattery, you know. Yeah, so, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, leverage yeah. it to push your thing, you know what I'm saying? Well, that's what I'm thinking. Yes. Like, what have you guys done to build leverage? Like, what's something that's worked for you? And it may not work for everyone, but someone might say, Oh, I think that would really work for me. For us, I think it was really just learning what works on different platforms, especially as a digital creator, just like from a purely algorithm standpoint, like we had to learn about YouTube versus Instagram and learn how to di like edit our content diff differently from different mm -hmm. platforms, basically. Yeah. Like we started, we were only posting Instagram videos. We didn't even have a YouTube page. Um, it was all on Instagram and Instagram actually they don't like longer content they like shorter content so we post our episodes and our episodes are short like the first season was only a minute so it's not long but even posting those minute long videos we would only get maybe 800 views like pretty low engagement so then we had the idea to start making memes of moments that happened in the episode so like the actual episode might only get 800 views and then we post like a three second five second meme and that'll get 10,000 views so like the discrepancy is extreme and on youtube it's the opposite where they prefer 
longer form content. So we'd post our one minute episodes on YouTube and they would do really badly because YouTube actually promotes content that is at least three minutes or longer. So it's really just learning. Um, I think what whatever platform you're using, you have to not only be a creator, especially like me and Julissa, like we do this ourselves. We pro- like I produce it like we do the voices, our friends do the voices. It's, there's no team, it's just two people doing everything. So we sort of had to learn all of these things and marketing is extremely important because you could make an amazing product, but if you don't know how to market it properly, no one's going to see it. So true, so true. Absolutely. Yeah, Phoebe, please. Yeah, no, I mean, I can talk about some of the cool things we did, you know, and I'll be honest, we probably had the, the kind of the opposite problem. Like our community was actually organically huge from the start. Now, obviously Jada, you know, is an international star. Her husband is an international star, you know, so they were able to kind of leverage their social platforms to do some initial promotion. Um, and people came, you know, folks were like, wow, you know, they're talking about some stuff that they had never talked about before as a family. So I think that was a big hook for people to just want to come and kind of see who, okay. Cause there's been tons of, you know, comments and thoughts about what was going on. Um, so I think just the rawness of even that first ep- um, uh, episode with her and Will's ex-wife, Cherie, really set the tone. And so from that part, you're able to really lean into, okay, we've got this huge community. I mean, we probably had almost half a million people in a Facebook group, you know, within like the first six months, which is, which is big. Um, and so my thoughts were, okay, how do I galvanize this group? How do I keep them engaged? And how do I get them to be, become ambassadors for more people? So we actually had one, one idea, well, one thing that we ended up um, discovering from looking at some of the data and ended up d- doubling down on was there were um, a lot of women who would kind of launch their own Red Table Talks group pages in the Facebook, uh, Facebook world. There were Red Table Talk Virginia, Atlanta, Los Angeles, and these ladies were doing it on their own for free. And so we began to reach out to all of them and actually pull them into the fold and actually turn them into kind of like first, we call them the RTTOG, so kind of like first look hey, we're thinking about trying to do something, we want to get your feedback, or can you tap into your communities and begin to be ambassadors for different ideas that we had? And they really responded. And things like Jada shouting them out on the show, you know, doing very specific um, features, you know, about what they were doing in their own local communities. It really helped people understand we're people who are watching, wow, like people are being seen, you know, we would have monthly, uh, monthly, um, uh, conference calls with the ladies and they would actually talk directly to Jada. So that was really exciting. So just really trying to personalize and, um, you know, just bring together, I think, an, under, an idea that we see you, we see the value in you. And even though, you know, you're sort of thinking about this, you know, larger than life celebrity, we brought it down to like the very individual um, person who was running this group, you know, who was just doing it because they loved the show and love what, what, what it stood for. And we're getting a lot of recognition because of that. That's one thing that we did definitely agree with Ray in terms of cutting different things behind the scenes. We would shoot for two hours, but you'd only see 25 minutes worth of content on the actual episodes between 25 to 30. So we would do, do a lot of behind the scenes stuff, cutting certain things for, um, you know, Instagram versus Facebook, you know, we had a ton of people who would create art, you know, who create songs. I mean, there were a lot of things people were doing. And our goal was to try and regenerate that as much as we could to let the community know we were paying attention. Well, and I think what both of you are speaking to is like recognizing your audience. If they're on Instagram, this is the kind of stuff they want. They want the men's. If they're on YouTube, they want the longer content, you know, and, and even Jada saying, I got to engage my audience, you know, so that I can really make the most of this. And I think just recognizing what the audience is, recognizing what the platforms are. I think a lot of people think I'm going to make one thing, one size fits all and share it everywhere. And it's just not the nature of the beast anymore. You know, you have to tailor it. Like you're saying, take that extra time. If you want to build the audience, it's going to get you whatever the next thing is, pitching your show and being able to go in and say, we already have this many people or getting those writing opportunities because somebody saw your show, like whatever, or getting those distribution offers. If you don't have an audience, it's not going to happen. You know, even if the content's great, you know, it's just not going to happen. Lisa, do you want to add something? Yeah, I had, I didn't know anything about like audience building. I wasn't even on Instagram when I made my show. I was like an indie filmmaker doing this thing. But you know what? I had to crowdfund. (laughs) So crowdfunding was actually how I began building my audience. Um, The nauseating, you know, 
thing of posting four times a day, essentially about yourself and asking people to support your show that nobody even, it doesn't even exist yet was really like kind of an amazing thing to do. And I saw who showed up, you know, from my world. And it was not, you know, it was people from like grade school who just came out of like the Facebook, you know, far away places and were the ones who were my biggest supporters and were so excited for the journey of this series. So getting that like core group on board before I even made it and then having them follow the evolution of it, just it, it felt really good. And it gave me a lot of confidence and it gave me like somebody to be accountable for because I always took these people's money. Like I had to deliver and it's got to be great because I told them it was. So that was an awesome audience building process for me. Yeah, and I wanted to move into budget. So I think crowdfunding is a good segue because for independent artists, crowdfunding can help you with both, right? It, it helps you start to build your audience. It helps you bring in money. I've done it three times. Every time I do it, I say it's awful and I won't do it again. <laughs> and then I do it again. I'm like, oh, you know. So maybe now we've said, my partner and I, he and I, we've said not again. So maybe now we won't do it again. <laughs> but <laughs> because even once you built your audience, it still feels like starting again, you know, um, in some ways. And also you don't want to overtap your audience. I mean, ours were over a very long period of time. Um, and sometimes in partnership with other people, but you know, how do you budget? Do you put ads and promotion money in or, you know, Ray, different editing costs? Like, you know, do you just say we've got no budget? So it's just going to be me and this other person. It's our passion project. I mean, my partner and I have certainly done that a lot. So, you know, and how do you, how do you approach setting a budget for a web series, you know, and thinking, and, and that's going to be successful and that's going to work and that's going to, you know, help you meet your needs, not just like, oh, I shot it, I have the money to shoot it, crap, you know, what's now? And I think we, people have that pitfall a lot. They, you know, all these actors, when we would send them copy, they'd be like, no one ever sends us copy because people raise money to shoot their indie film and then they jump off a cliff, you know, they fall into oblivion. So, you know, how do you see the project through from that perspective? How do you plan your budget for your, for your web series, how many episodes, how many seasons, you know, you know, how do you, do you guys each approach those things and Kitty, maybe on other web series that you've been a part of as well. Of course you can speak to that. Um, I, I'll keep going. I can keep going yeah. for a second. Uh, so pretty for me, pretty traditionally, um, I, I wrote it without, you know, I wrote it with budget in mind, you know, minimal number of locations, minimal number of actors. I had access to almost everything I needed location wise, except for a doctor's office, which ended up being one time a therapist's office and one time a dermatologist's office, neither time a fertility doctor. So that was an excellent production designer. But I knew it was 10 episodes and we just worked backwards from there. I hired, you know, a line producer and we went through it and it was like, how much is everything going to cost? Okay. For me, I've done the like, don't pay anybody thing in film school. And I wasn't going to do that again. And I was, I was hiring people and this was my baby and my business. So it was really important to me that everyone on set got paid at least minimum wage. So that got factored in. And then, um, shooting on Saturdays and Sundays when people will lower their rates for you if they love the project, making the days fun and not 13 hours. Um, and yeah, I mean, but we really worked backwards from what do we need. And then that was, I think I said, I think I can do it for 35,000, you know, shoot it and get it edited for 35,000. And I raised 37. So it was like, lit and I didn't pay myself, unfortunately. <laughs> so it was literally, I, I recommend you do. That was <laughs> decision in retrospect so, yeah 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 I mean I'll, I'll hop in I mean I echo everything Lisa said I mean I I like I said worked as a producer so you're always thinking about kind of budget you know and, and what kind of what's the next thing um and I think it's also you know I mean I like the fact that she sort of highlight you know 10 episodes like because the question is like how many episodes do you need to tell this story um, because if you can do it, it, maybe you initially thought you needed 10, but you can do it in eight. That's something to kind of keep in mind because budget does come into play. The other thing is also thinking about the number of episodes to, that it takes to build an audience, because I think sometimes people will sort of be like, okay, I got enough money to like make the pilot. And then there's nothing left to like do multiple episodes or you'll even release something that's maybe one or two episodes. 
sort of setting it up, but then you don't have anything, you know, down the road. So I just think it's important to sort of think holistically about, you know, what is your end goal with this? Like, are you just, are you trying to build audience? Are you trying to build audience and to potentially use this as a calling card to try and, you know, get a writing job or whatever the case is, you know, because I think all that stuff can come into play. But starting with that end question in mind, I think helps you kind of do the back end work that Lisa highlighted, you know, absolutely. And I think in today's world to not consider marketing <laughs> as a part of your budget, I think it's just doing a disservice to the success, to the potential success of your project. You know, I know you talked about like paid ads versus organic, you know, um, views and all that kind of stuff. You know, with Red Table Talk, we absolutely, you know, did a lot of that stuff, especially for some of the um, projects that I was doing sort of as sort of ancillary support, you know, because we had the show, which was, you know, big, you know, bigger budget, you know, relative, you know, to kind of probably what, you know, the average, you know, indie web series person is doing. But the question was, okay, beyond that, how do I get people to then say, hey, I don't, I don't just want to come to read to the Facebook uh, page to watch the show, but I'm also willing to listen to the podcast, or I'm also willing to buy the book, or, you know, we were thinking about rolling out, you know, well, we did, we, we launched a, an e-commerce opportunity where we sold like a game over the holiday that was, you know, a derivative of kind of the show concept called We're Not Really Strangers. And it was a Red Table Talk expansion pack. So I was thinking, okay, how do I get people who are not necessarily coming to the show for that to then think about those other things. So we had to be very creative with sort of, you know, additional content campaigns that we did to try and get an email address or, you know, to get somebody to put their credit card down, you know, so thinking about all of those things um, budget wise was really important. And we, you know, we were able to have money to actually do paid ads. Um, but then, like I said, we had that community, you know, on Facebook, um, you know, and obviously Instagram too. Um, and so that was also folks who we would tap and say, hey, we have this thing, we're coming out. Can you promote it? Can you push it to your people? Um, you know, so making sure you're leveraging the free stuff, but keeping in mind that you may have to do a little bit of paid spin too, um, is always helpful. Mm -hmm. Ray, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll jump in because me we did the complete opposite of all of this. We and were that's what I want janky. people to know. Yeah, I, I yeah. feel like there's a lot of janky people out there just like me that <laughs> don't know what they're doing but want to get stuff out there. So I'll give you the no-budget version <laughs> of how to do something. Um, so, yeah, we basically, like I said, we wrote to our budget. We knew we didn't have that much money so we found the cheapest animator that we could find and he charged $85 a minute and so that's why our episodes were a minute because we could only afford to pay for one minute of animation so um, we uh, wrote we wrote new scripts um, I like I guess I'm the executive producer so I rewrote um, Jaleesa's scripts wrote new scripts um, yeah, and our only cost, honestly, was animation, because I did all the editing myself. I did, um, you know, added in sound effects. Um, Julissa did the voice of the main character. I would hop in and do a voice if necessary. We'd get our friends to do voices. And, of course, people are willing to hang out when, or help out when it's only a minute. Um, there was no professional equipment <laughs> involved. Literally, people would record the voices on their phone and send me the recording, and I'd edit it into one clip and send that along with the script to the animator. So it was very, very um, scrappy, no budget at all, but we managed to get it done. I also come, I'm a graphic designer as well, so I come from that background in marketing. So when we did build our Instagram page, I was able to, you know, design graphics for us to use. We had, we, the second season, we did do some crowdfunding, but it only probably accounted for, I would say, maybe 30% of the budget. The rest we still paid for. But as part of the crowdfunding, if people donated, I would do a little illustration for them, like in the cartoon style, and people really liked that. We'd post it on Instagram. People would also post it on their Instagram, and then that would drive people to follow us. So I think it was just being very creative. Like, I always tell people, because I think budget constraints is obviously anyone's number one concern if they say, I have this idea, but I don't have any money to make it. I think that you can always create something to your budget 
even if you have like a huge idea, I tell people, you know, if you have a genre fantasy show idea, you can't really make a low budget version of Star Wars. Like it's not going to look right, but you can make a scripted podcast of, of a fantasy show, of a genre show, and you can do that for extremely cheap. So I think that no matter what the idea is, you can always make some version of it that works on your budget. And I don't think that should stop anyone from creating anything. No, and I think that's a really great message. And it's interesting, my partner, so done with crowdfunding, he taught himself how to code like last summer. And then he taught himself how to build a PC so he could start creating video games. I'm like, oh, okay, so he like, so now he's making video games so that he doesn't have to like raise the money to do film anymore. And he really loves the video game space. And you know, we are diverse people, he and I telling diverse stories. So he's also like, and if you think the film industry is white, you know, he's, he's going like, there's nobody that looks like him. He's mm -hmm. Dominican and African American. He's like, there's nobody like me making video games. Like, there, or there's like five people. He's found a group now. He's like, there's like five of us. <laughs> so, you know, just saying, you know, I want to create, I don't want to deal with that anymore. So I'm just going to teach myself how to code and I'm going to learn how to make video games. I think it's what you're saying. Like, if you really have that drive and passion to create, you think creatively and you think about how am I going to get this done? You know, and that's what you guys did. And I think that's what we all do, no matter what budget we're at, because even on the big end, it still feels like never enough. You know, <laughs> oh, absolutely. Still, yeah. You're still like, you know, still in from Peter to pay Paul and going, uh, how are we going to get everything we want to get done? Cause we all do have these big dreams and these, these big goals. Mm -hmm. And um, so I love that, like make something that you can with the resources that you have. And, in that vein, I think a lot of people think about the web series as an answer to make something, you know, you don't have to get that deal from a TV. You don't have to do the same thing you need for a feature film. It's not that same hustle and work. So how did each of you approach this or how do each of you view the web series, the digital platforms for career building, for what your goals are? You know, how do you view that opportunity for people thinking, this is where I want to go. Is this the right thing for me to do to help me get, you know, where I'm trying to go? I mean, I'll, I'll start. I mean, you know, I, um, I never, like, I, I always started as, I always started with the understanding that I want to be a producer. So for me, this was about creativity and testing that muscle. Um, you know, and so web series, I mean, and I'll give an example of an early web series, you know, that I've worked on in my career, you know, when I did not have money and we were definitely, as Ray said, you know, trying to rob Peter to pay Paul, make a dollar holla, whatever you want to say. <laughs> um, you know, it was, it was a, a series called The Cooler and it was basically like us talking about kind of, um, uh, current events. And initially we were like, let's have like five people standing around a cooler to kind of like talk about this. And the writer was a really fun comedian. So like the scripts were so punchy and that's really what was going to sing. And initially we were struggling to find sort of talent to do this. And then finally we realized, you know what? We don't need to see their faces. Like we actually could just shoot this from the bottom down. You know, they're in front of a cooler and they're talking. And the idea of hearing them talk and go back and forth could be recorded anywhere. You didn't have to deal with the challenges of getting actors in the same room and all that kind of stuff. We ended up doing it. It worked <laughs> brilliantly. And it was kind of a cool little quirk with the show too, because it was not necessarily what you were seeing all the time. So just another example of like, to, to Ray's point, you know, what she made so eloquently is, you know, you got to, if you have an idea, you cannot be wet to only doing it one way if you want to make it in this town. And I think speaking to just sort of career possession, career progression, you know, as somebody who kind of started in the, you know, kind of early 2000s and, you know, now in the 2020s, um, the ability to be creative and to think outside the box and to not be deterred, grit, you know, all of the things that I think are required to make it in this town, no matter whether you want to be a writer, director, producer, video game creator, whatever the case is, animator, um, is so key. And I think doing web series and actually creating them first, then figuring out how to get them to the audience and then build audience is a great way to see if you have it. You know, I mean, see if you really want to do this, you know, see if you really have the skills to be creative. Um, because it, it, you know, like you said, there's a lot of content out there that's being made that no one's seeing. You know, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of talented people out there that have great ideas, but they don't have what it takes to do the crowdfunding that Lisa did, you know, and do the crowdfunding that, you know, we've all had to do because it takes discipline. It takes working with people. It takes not being afraid to put yourself out there. It takes not being afraid to be rejected. I mean, those are all things that we all struggle with. Um, so a web series is a perfect way to sort of see, okay, I, 
And then to Lisa's point, you're excited. People who you haven't talked to in 30 years come back and they're like, yo, I'm gonna give you some money. <laughs> Just because you're living a dream I may not have been able to do or whatever their exactly. reason is. Um, and that's what gives you excitement and makes you want to keep going. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, um, you know, a web series for me, it was, I wanted the dream, right? I wanted the awkward black girl, broad city, high maintenance. Like I set out to make it and have somebody say yes and buy it. So that particular like straight to half hour dream did not happen. However, um, it won awards in film festivals. Like festivals are another great way to grow your audience and to become a part of a community. I also started doing stand up because I was like, all right, here's another way. Every time they introduce me at the comedy store, they say Lisa Eversall has 37 problems and everybody has to go figure out what that is because all the other people are on shows that people have heard of. Um, so yeah, I mean, there were, there were ways like that, but in terms of career, it's, you know, it's still a great writing sample. It's still a show I can point everybody to. Uh, and, I, and it got me meetings and legitimacy in the industry very quickly, which I had in the theater world, but did not have like visual evidence of myself as a writer, director, actor, producer. And if you're planning to be anything, any one of those, you have to have evidence that you can do that thing. And I needed to show that I could do, you know, all four. If I want to be Issa Rae, if I want to be the Broad City people or the high maintenance people. And this allowed me to do that. Yeah, I would agree with Lisa that it's just proof of your skill. Um, I think, especially as a writer, um, I've worked on this. I'm currently a script coordinator on a Netflix show. I was a writer's assistant. But find, I meet a lot of people that say they want to do things but don't do any of them <laughs> and I feel like the number one thing is to just do it if you say you're a writer but you don't have any scripts well I don't know if you're a writer <laughs> if, if you say you're an actor but haven't acted anything it, it's the same uh same concept so I think it's always it's better to have on your resume 10 things that you produce yourself than to have no, you know, like I worked at Forever 21 and now I'm trying to get a job as a writer. Like that, that doesn't work. So I think that you should always make things. You can always make things on a bu small budget. If you can't make something, I'm sure your friend's making something. Hop on your friend's project. Help them make whatever they want to make. Help some person in a Facebook group make what they want to make. But I think it's just building community and networking is crucial in this industry um, and doing your own work and meeting other people, creatives that are also doing their own work will just make you a stronger creative and give you the necessary experience to then transition if you want to, you know, work on a studio network show or even if you want to just keep being independent, that's totally fine and making your own stuff. That's Though both are equally valid routes, but you need to do something. The first step is to do something. Definitely. And you guys have all done some things, some things with a with an S, plural. <laughs> and I just love that, you know, especially I think, you know, some people, not everyone, but some of us, we have more time right now to create. Um, we have more time to think outside the box, to bank those scripts you know, like to be able to come out and say, look, I have five new projects or, and also I think some people I'm talking to are saying, I'm getting the ear of people I couldn't before because some people are a little more accessible now that they're just, you know, not having to do the office thing. So I think it's like using this time wisely, especially to show that you're creative and you're versatile, because I think that also sells in the industry. If you are creative and you're versatile and you can wear lots of hats and you can adapt, I think adaptability the industry is seeing is way more important than anybody thought before, you know, especially going through the pandemic. So I love that each of you has that and, and has shared that. So we're getting close to wrapping up. So I want to ask you all, I always like to ask, what are you working on? You know, maybe besides the things we've talked about, or if it's just those things, what are you working on and what are you watching? I always like to know what people are watching right now, what they think we should be watching. So what do you, you know, what's inspiring you as a creator really is what that's about. So what are you working on? What are you watching? Or reading? Oh, I'll go. I'm working like I, I'm a script coordinator on The Witcher on Netflix. Oh. So 
that's what I'm at work. That's my job. <laughs> that's what I do. Uh, I'm currently, uh, like I said, trying to develop uh, the cartoon into a half hour. So I'm working on a pitch deck, um, the, you know, for a few weeks. And I'm currently watching, I'll say I, I rewatch, I'm rewatching The Office because I do a lot of rewatching. But um, I started watching the new season of Pin 15, which is my favorite. And everyone should watch that show. <laughs> Lots of comedy inspiring you, and you do comedy, so that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I feel like the world, for me, the world is dark enough these days. <laughs> I'm not trying to watch anything that deep. I did watch I May Destroy You, though, but um, I think that that's just no more deep stuff for me. I'm just trying to laugh. <laughs> yeah, I can totally relate to that, Ray. <laughs> Although I can't say my view current viewing habits are reflecting that. Um, <laughs> but in terms of what I'm working on, so I actually, I, I left for Table Talk kind of earlier in the year. So right now, and just for context, I um, was running a company. So my focus now has been more on kind of building digital content businesses, you know, so obviously working with content creators, but also working with the tech side. So working with developers and product people to kind of think about user experience and how do we improve or build new stuff. Um, and then obviously entrepreneurially, like what are some interesting ways we can use existing IP and things like that to kind of go into new markets. So I'm entertaining a couple of other opportunities, new opportunities now in that space. So um, you know, you'll probably hear some announcements coming down the road in terms of where I end up landing. I um, would also say I'm working on getting the vote out. <laughs> so I don't know when this is going to air, but absolutely, you know, and trying to get as many of my friends, you know, just registered and active and engaged and, you know, excited to do their civic um, duty, you know, in November. Um, and then in terms of stuff I'm watching, you know, it's interesting. I have been watching um, a lot of, a lot of, Newer stuff, I mean, Lovecraft Country is something new I've been watching. You know, a big fan of the boys. I got ex exposed to that. I got exposed to Cobra Kai Late, um, which is the series I was on YouTube, um, read, but binged it in, on Netflix in like, you know, two days, like I think 48 hours. And to Ray's point, it was just fun. It was light, you know, the boys is not any of that. <laughs> so just to kind of have some balance. Um, yes, yeah, so I've been consuming a lot of content actually. Um, and I would say, you know, it's a really, awesome time to be a consumer in the digital world just because there's a lot of really interesting stuff out there not only mainstream but you know on on web platforms my uh fiance actually owns a digital streaming platform called black and sexy tv and so he literally does this every day in terms of thinking about ideas and, and original content stuff so he and i are also doing some work together to kind of re-engineer re some of the things with his company too um I totally forgot. I, was, I love listening to you guys. I completely forgot the question. Uh, what am I? Oh, what am I working on? Right. Uh, well, I just finished a romantic comedy feature, which took me most of quarantine, which was a paid job, which is awesome. And I totally had a red table talk scene in there. So I have to tell you that you guys made it as the talk show that the character went on. Yes. Uh, but it was like a Philly edition because I couldn't get her all the way to L.A. for a day. So they were I can't remember. They were in Philly. Uh, and I'm also working on the half hour follow up to 37 problems, which is looking for a baby daddy, uh, the a co parenting baby daddy who wants to be 50 50 on everything except for romance. So that's the half hour I'm writing. And then I also have a coaching business, I coach screenwriters of how to write through their authentic lens, which is basically writing a thing that nobody else but you can just because that's what's worked for me and the people I know in breaking into the industry, which is what a lot of us are trying to do. Uh, and in terms of watching Ted Lasso, very fun, mindless. Mythic Quest quarantine episode is like the best thing I've seen. I loved it so much. Really shows you, like Ray was saying, what you can do with tons of constraints and only one person on screen at a time. And then Normal People and I May Destroy You were my favorite new shows of quarantine. Nice, nice. Well, it's been so fun chatting with you all and hearing all of this inspiration. I think people will totally come away with this with useful tips and to maybe get started if they haven't started yet and start creating something. Please also, as we sign off, please also share where we can find you on social, where you want us to follow you. You know, like we want to be a part of your audience. So 
where can we find you on social? Like, where would you like us to follow you? Well, I'll go first. So my name is Kibi Anderson, K-I-B-I Anderson. And I'm literally that everywhere at Kibi Anderson on Instagram, Kibi Anderson on Facebook, Kibi Anderson on Twitter. So just Google Kibi Anderson, it'll pop up. <laughs> but definitely would love to have everybody come join my community. Um, you know, and I, I do a lot of talking about, you know, sort of ways to uh, build businesses, career advancement, that kind of thing. So if you're interested in hearing more about that, please stay tuned. Lisa, come on. Yeah, uh, I am at Lisa Ebersol on everything. And the series is at 37problems.com. That'll give you like several options of where you can watch it. And at 37problems TV is its specific Instagram handle. But at Lisa Ebersol is the easier one. Great. And Ray, what about you? <laughs> I, first, I need to hire Kibi to help me with my business. <laughs> Sorry, I'm following. But um, yeah, you can visit us at juliesahu.com, J U L I S A W H O.com. The IG, YouTube, everything, all the links are there. And then, actually, I forgot to mention this, but I also started a business um, at the beginning of the year to help marginalized communities gain access to the entertainment industry um i actually i did a webinar webinar earlier today um, with one of the producers of insecure and black lady sketch show so follow my company it was free and i'm gonna post a recording for free so um you can follow my company it's called in the cut and you can follow us on instagram at in the cut la or go to the website in the cut la.org well, thank you so much. I'm inspired. I'm totally inspired by everything <laughs> that you all are doing. And I love, I love that there were like through lines that connected everybody's work a little bit. <laughs> so but maybe I, I didn't even know when I when I selected each of you. So that's always a cool surprise. So thank you all so much. Um, be well, be safe, get out and vote. If you don't have a registration plan, make one, you know, get a friend to drive you there, whatever you got to do. Um, thank you for that reminder, Kiwi. Very important. I recently moved. So I'm like, making sure I'm registered in my new state, you know? So it's like top one. Yeah, priority. you forget, you don't realize those things. Yeah, yeah, so. I'm like, oh, wait, I have to be registered here. Time's <laughs> running out. So thank you all for your time this evening. Keep being creative and keep safe, everyone. Thanks so much. Awesome, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks everybody. Thanks.